The Hammersmith Haunting is a Call of Cthulhu one-shot scenario written by Cat Clay that can be usually played in one session. I completed it with my players in about two hours and I can't see it going much longer than four. Today I will be reviewing The Hammersmith Haunting and giving you some top keeper tips if you're planning to run this scenario. The scenario takes place in London 1890, which is really in the midst of industrialization. The investigators are all a part of a philosophical club where they debate certain topics and different viewpoints are really welcomed. And the scenario starts off with one of the members, John Collins, who is the vicar of St. Paul's Church in Hammersmith, Hammersmith being a suburb outside of London. He has some information that he wants to share and is really excited about de delving into with the investigators. Investigators soon learn that the suburb of Hammersmith is having some issues with dreams and possibly a ghost sighting. Now, from this point forward, there's going to be a ton of spoilers. Right off the bat, I want to call out how much I love the organization of this scenario, especially the Keeper's information section right at the beginning. This is very clear, right to the point, doesn't hide any secrets from the Keeper, and lays out the investigator's goals in a pretty short amount of time. I really like it when scenarios are very upfront about what's going on, what the investigators are gonna have to do, and the general premise right in that little paragraph, and I can have that mindset as I'm going through and planning the rest of the scenario. In addition to being really clear in this section, the entire scenario was laid out very well and organized in a way that was incredibly easy to follow. So what's actually going on here? When the investigators show up to meet with John Collins, he doesn't show up, which is incredibly weird because Collins is a very punctual man. Well, it turns out Collins is no longer living, which they're going to find out very soon when they travel to Hammersmith to try and check up on him. Due to the reconstruction of the church in Hammersmith, the crypt underneath has been disturbed. And an incredibly fun NPC to play, Alfred Dunning, he actually was stumbling along one evening collecting animal bones as he just does. He, he makes different items and buttons out of these animal bones. He hears a calling from the crypt and he goes down to investigate and is roped in to the being, the spirit that is in these bones and controlled and gives him the chance to take all of the bones from the crypt and keep them in his possession. Now the bones that were removed from the crypt is actually from a medieval woman who is named Diafrith and actually turns out to be Narlithotep's daughter. So, you know, no big deal. She was killed in the 12th century by Templars and now that the crypt has been opened, she is haunting Hammersmith. Her goal is to try and consume strong bodied people to up her health and restore her human form. So the investigator's job is to try and stop this from happening by putting the bones back in the crypt, but also having to kill her ghost spirit body. Once the investigators gather that John is not going to show up to this meeting, they are likely gonna go to Hammersmith and check up on him. Immediately as they're going to cross the bridge into the suburb, there's a dense fog that surrounds them. The cool thing about the fog is it actually imposes a penalty die for checks outside when they're in the fog. One of the cool things for me as a keeper was that the descriptions were really well written. So as I was reading the scenario, I was able to picture this environment and what was going on and it was entertaining for me to read. But it was also helpful for me to be able to relay that information and describe it to my players as we were playing the game. As they leave the bustle of the city of London and follow the Thames towards Hammersmith, the landscape is gradually replaced by a deepening whiteness. The investigators have experienced thick, persistent fog before, but this has an uncanny pervasiveness. The lights of Hammersmith are barely visible from across the river as they approach the Hammersmith Bridge. Water laps at the foundations of the Hammersmith Bridge. The fog slowly changes from glaring white to eerie blue from the coming of the night. But something to mention is that the descriptions were pretty in-depth and it didn't leave a lot of room for if your players didn't go in the exact order that the scenario laid out. In general, the scenario is incredibly linear. It assumes that your players are going to go from point A to B to C to D to E and that is just the path that they're naturally going to take. And while a lot of players might do that, my players ended up going in a couple different directions 
and it didn't leave a lot of room for me to be able to add different clues, different places, because it was so linearly written. So all that to say, if you have a more veteran Call of Cthulhu group, Playing this scenario, they might end up wanting a little bit more. So as a keeper, be prepared to maybe go to the vicar's house, which is originally not in the scenario, or a library. Go to a couple different places besides just the core path. But getting back to the scenario, hopefully when they reach Hammersmith, they wander towards the inn. And this is where I actually learned that publican was a word. Publican is someone who owns or manages a pub, which is usually a British English word, but it was cool for me to learn something new, and it's a really fun word to say. Publican. At the pub, this will be the first place the investigators get a sighting of Alfred Dunning, as there's going to be an interaction with him and the person who owns the pub going back and forth. Alfred, unfortunately, hasn't been paying his bills for the alcohol he's been drinking, so the owner is not too keen to let him in the pub this evening. And this is your first chance to kind of do some mumblings about bones and show the players that this might be an important NPC in the future. This is where the investigators also learn that the Viker has passed away and his body is actually at the pub. Once they go and check out the body, this is actually where I have one of my top keeper tips for this scenario, which is to have one of your players play the Doctor pregen. So there are five pregen characters. I had four players in my group, and none of them ended up choosing the Doctor, which is funny because I think that one is the most relevant for this scenario and is really helpful because they're likely gonna have the skills to be able to look further at the body. My players didn't end up doing much with the body other than being able to find a key on it, and that will be used for the church later, but they didn't do a ton with the body, which is part of how hallucinations are going to start for this scenario, and these hallucinations are very important for the end of the scenario. So important keeper tip, if your investigators decide not to open up the body or not examine it very much, move how the hallucinations happen. So instead of them happening when the body is opened, have them happen after a certain amount of time of being in the room with the stench, or maybe if the investigator touches the body, anything to trigger this hallucination for Diaphrith to start messing with their minds, because this is super important for the end of the scenario. If players have this hallucination, they're seeing them worshiping something, and they're actually physically forced down to their knees. Make sure you're keeping track of who is forced down their knees at any time during the scenario, as that's going to affect how they play in the final fight with Diaphrith. Now from here, the scenario assumes that people are going to go straight to the church, but it's nighttime by now, and my players did not want to go straight to the church. Which is fine, not a big deal. They just waited till the next day and traveled to the church to check some things out. Now the important clues to get here is the key to the crypt, if they haven't already gotten that from the pub, and a handout which explains Diaphrith's background and kind of what's going on. Now one thing that I loved about the scenario is that it had built-in fail-forward mechanics. So what I mean by that is that the key was in multiple places if they didn't get it on the body, and this handout actually had two different versions depending on the roles that your investigators made. So if your players failed the Latin roll, they still got the important information and I would give them the handout that had the bits and pieces to make the story kind of work. Whereas if they passed their Latin, they were able to translate the whole page and got the full story of what was going on. And I thought that was a great addition to the game and made it really easy for me as a keeper to decide what information needs to be given to them based on their role. My players ended up actually getting the full story, believe it or not, and they were able to read through the whole background. One of the callouts that my players had at the end was there was a specific line that threw them off a little bit and was probably a missed opportunity for the scenario. Part of this handout says that Diaphrith was pierced in her heart with a blessed spear. As a keeper, that's a key phrase that I would pick up on and say, maybe there's a specific spear that these players need to get to be able to kill Diaphrith. Or maybe there's a weapon that needs to be blessed in a certain way or by a certain person to be able to successfully finish this scenario. 
but instead that's not really relevant to the scenario and they're able to kill Diaphrith with whatever they have. So if you're looking to add a little bit more to this scenario, then this would be a really cool thing to have a go get this or go bless this before you can actually complete everything and it would add a little bit more depth to the game. So as they investigate the church, they're gonna eventually go down to the crypt and see that there are no skeleton bones down there. Hopefully they piece together that Alfred Dunning is the one that probably has possession of these bones, but if not, there's a lot of different opportunities to kind of slip in hints that this is the case. As mentioned before, Dunning is a very fun NPC to play, and as my players were walking into his house, it was essentially a hoarder's house except with bones, which is very creepy. Bones kind of all over in different piles, falling from shelves, a disorganized Dunning coming out of the kitchen and asking if they need anything. This interaction probably could go a lot of different ways to try and get the bones, including stealthing in, convincing Dunning, or distracting him. There's a ton of different options for the investigators to get what they're looking for, but I do want to tell the story of what happened in my game because it was so fun. I was showing off my different things like buttons and different collections that I had made with the bones to try and get them to pay me some money because Alfred Dunning is a little short on cash. My players were asking for some very special bones, like what are his best bones? And after some persuasion, he shared that he had some secret bones in the basement. Um, but it would take a really special project to be able to give up those bones. My players managed to convince Alfred that they were going to commission a piece of art and they needed the best bones possible to make this art. And I just really love the concept of Alfred getting excited about commissioning a piece of artwork and that's what motivates him to be able to give up these bones. So then the final piece of the scenario is to put the bones back where they are and when they go back to the crypt, they're actually going to get in a fight with Diaphrit's ghost. And this fight is also very scripted, so there are specific attacks that happen in each round. Feel free to mix up the different attacks if you feel like that's appropriate for your game. However, it worked pretty well for me to actually follow the steps that were laid out in the scenario. Overall, I would say it is a tough fight, but it's certainly doable. I think that the fight was balanced really well and had an appropriate level of difficulty for the investigators. Unfortunately, my investigators got a little bit un unlucky. One of them fumbled their power roll. And keep in mind, anyone who had visions or hallucinations earlier in the scenario are going to be more susceptible to these power rolls and converting them into servants of Diaphrith. So this one person that fumbled was obviously converted into a servant. I pulled her aside into a different room and told her to turn on her fellow investigators and try to attack them and prevent Diaphrith from dying. So that was a lot of fun for that player. And then the hair swipe took out two of my other investigators, dealing them major wounds, and they both passed out. <laughs> so then that left one other investigator who decided nope, I don't think I can handle this by myself. I will be your servant and willingly converted over into serving Diaphrith. Diaphrith then said he had to prove his worth and said, okay, you have to kill one of these knocked out players to prove that you are actually my servant. And the investigator ended up doing just that. So now we have two servants, a dead person, and then one that was chained up for later so Diaphrith could get more of her strength back. And that is how the scenario ended for my group. The ending was a ton of fun and I'm really glad it kind of wrapped up in a not so winning state, like the investigators ended up not fulfilling their goal, but it was a lot of fun to play out that ending. Overall thoughts, this is a pretty linear scenario. It had a lot of good descriptions. It was organized really well and had some key places where the roles should take place and what should be rolled in each given scenario. And it's pretty short as well. So all of those factors, I actually think that this would make an incredible convention scenario, but also a great scenario for new keepers. I'm gonna be adding this to my list of recommendations for beginning keepers because I think it's pretty easy to run and is straightforward as well. 
And in regards to convention, I think it would be a really fun, quick one shot to throw in and you'd be able to get through the whole content in a pretty good amount of time. Speaking of which, I have a video talking about the benefits of playing RPGs at conventions if you want to check that out. So with all that being said, I think that if you have a more veteran Call of Cthulhu group that you might want to expand the scenario a little bit more by adding the Bless Spear as something that they actually have to go and get or accomplish or adding some other places and additional clues to figure out what is going on. And they can go to different paths as opposed to just the straightforward path listed in the scenario. There's also the whole concept of her being the daughter of Narlithotep. I think there's a lot you could do there with Narlithotep maybe taking over some of the townspeople and bringing chaos to this whole town and things going awry. We definitely enjoyed playing this scenario and experiencing the story that it had to tell. And I'll be linking it in the description below if you're interested in checking it out. I have additional Call Cthulhu scenario reviews in this playlist over here. And thank you so much for watching. Bye!